without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rick, who, by the way, is also one of our leading members. Please, uh, please start, Rick. Thank you, Mel. So today we have a presentation of the photography of Tom Nelligan. Um, I'm sure many of you knew Tom. I talked to a few people before the meeting who knew Tom well. I never got the chance to meet or even talk to Tom Nelligan, but I knew his name quite well uh, growing up in New Hampshire. Uh, a lot of people my age spent a lot of time, and still do spend a lot of time, uh, looking for railroad pictures on the internet. When I was a kid, um, Really the only place I could find photos of locations I was familiar with was online or in books. Um, I didn't quite know about the society yet, so I didn't know about the B&M Bulletin or anything like that. Um, but Tom Nelligan was one of the big names that we would look for when it came to pictures. Uh, Tom and Bruce Nelson is another one. Um, Tom passed away two years ago in two, uh, 2021. And um, I do have a uh, obituary I'd like to read before we get started about Tom. Uh, this was published by Trains Magazine. Tom Nelligan, who extensively rode, photographed, and wrote about Northeastern and Canadian railroads in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, died April 9, 2021, at the age of 70. The author of seven books about railroading, he was also a frequent contributor to both trains and passenger train journal. A native of Connecticut, Nelligan covered the final years of the New Haven Railroad in his home state prior to attending both Boston College and Boston College Law School from 1968 through 1975, and you'll notice as we get started with the presentation, you can tell that when he was a student, he was spending a lot of time trackside. Nelligan would remain in the Boston area for the rest of his life working in the region's technology sector. Nelligan wrote several memorable articles for trains, including How Penn Central Plus New Haven Equals Penn Central in January 1970, and Railroad, commuter, railroad Commuters Who Carries How Many Where in June 1977. In October 1972, the magazine published his Trains Turntable opinion piece, Dear Amtrak, a pointed critique of the then new passenger carrier. His article brought sharp reactions. Nelligan's byline was also a mainstay at PTJ. His brief history of the Bud Company, Citadel of Stainless Steel, was a keynote article in the magazine's issue-length tribute to Bud in October 1981. Among his books were New England Short Lines, published by Carstens in 1982, and Root of the Minuteman from Quadrant Press in 1980. I think that should be Bluebirds and Minutemen. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. Following the 1986 publication of Bluebirds and Minutemen, Nelligan largely dropped out of railroad publishing and focused his attention on music. He was a regular contributor to Dirty Linen Magazine, a now defunct journal of folk and world music, and is credited with promoting the careers of many folk musicians. He also had a deep interest in minor league baseball, making a point to attend several games each session at various ballparks. The friends of Tom Nelligan are involved in efforts to preserve his large negative and slide collection. And so in November of last year, I was down at our archives in North Chelmsford, Massachusetts, and I noticed a tub labeled Tom Nelligan, and I had to do a double take when I saw that, because of course his photos had been so formative in my interest in railroading and so many people of my age group um, that I was immediately interested in digitizing his collection. Uh, so far, in the last two months, I've worked through 680 slides and about 500 black and white negatives, uh, spanning from 1966 to about 1990. It seems that's when he started to fade out from photographing railroads. That, of course, is Tom. And the interesting thing, too, is that there's quite a bit of photography of Tom, um, self-portraits and shots of his dorm rooms and things uh, when he was a student, which kind of is interesting to me because when I was a student at Keene State, I spent a lot of time chasing trains. And so it was kind of an interesting parallel to see somebody who was my age doing it with the B&M when I was doing it with Pan Am. So our first image that we will start out with is Ayer, Massachusetts. And uh, the thing about Tom's photos is that there's not a lot of exact dates with them. Um, but we do have processing dates on the slides, so that gives us a pretty general idea of when they were taken. Uh, this was processed in uh, July 1983, and this is train W01, uh, Worcester train. You can see one of the flat top buggies that the B&M had. These were built by International Steel, uh, used primarily in local freight and transfer service. Uh, they weren't usually used on road freights, although they were in the 80s. 
Quite a number of these are still around in private ownership. Go back a little ways, and something I do want to clarify here is that Tom's photos uh, are sorted by the file name. They're not sorted chronologically. So you will see some chronological shots in series, um, but we're going to be kind of jumping around a little bit. So this is Bellows Falls, of course, on the Con River line. August 1st, 1966, we have B&M 4228A and 4268B, northbound passenger train. It's processed uh, August 1966, but it was taken August 1st. Rick, was, was he shooting black and white and color size at the same time? Or? Uh, yeah, so it seems so, yes. Um, in, he has very little pho photography from 1966 to 1969 in color. It's mostly black and white negatives. Uh, the color really comes in 1975, 76. But there is some earlier stuff that's in color. Uh, and he would have been pretty young, which makes me think it might have been family trips or something of that nature. But are you seeing like the same day in black and white and color um, when he goes through the files? Or? A couple of times, but not a lot. Huh. Mostly it seems like he carried maybe one camera with him. So, well, we're projectors. We're so. <laughs> this is Wilmington, of course, Massachusetts, uh, local WI1. It's taken, uh, well, processed in June of 1983. Uh, B&M 1555 GP7 with the local. Uh, I believe, I think that was Sweetheart Plastics at the left. Yeah. Yep. They also had a plant up in Manchester. Jumping way back a little bit further, this is Concord, New Hampshire. Um, 1960s, no date on this one, no processing date either. A um, couple of engines in the Concord track. Um, behind the liquor warehouse there, down in the yard, 1557, GP7, 1505RS3. You can see some hoppers in the background, which may be um, from the Portsmouth local, uh, the plant in Raymond, New Hampshire. Bow Junction, New Hampshire, the old Blue Seal plant, well, Merrimack Farmers at this point in time. Uh, it's now the Blue Seal plant in the background. Uh, the track to the left here was... Also Blue Seal, they had a, a location across the tracks as well, um, which I think there was, was one of their outlet locations. This is southbound freight with 1559, one of the very first engines in the Blue Dip scheme, if not the first. Uh, this was taken probably about 1960, probably about 1969 would be my guess. Heading into Boston, this was processed in March 1969. Uh, B&M 1561 with three R, uh, RDCs. It's interesting because obviously we don't think about GP7s and RS3, uh, RDCs rather, uh, being together until the late 70s, early 80s in commuter service. Um, but this is from the 60s, so quite a bit earlier. It's possible they were just doing an equipment move or something around North Station. Yeah, well, you said this was it showed as March of 69? It showed as March of 69. February 69, there was a substantial mm -hmm. Snowfall. Right, yep. In greater Huge. Boston. Yeah. yeah. We only had one week of school left. That's right. <laughs> now, I know they used the, the, the Jeep 7s in conjunction with the RDCs after the blizzard of 78. Would they have done that in March as well in 16? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah? Okay. So that was a regular thing with snowfall? It, it could be, yep. depending on the severity of the, of the snow. Good to know. Consistency of it, I suppose. Yeah, any, uh, by the way, too, any, any comments or information or locations anybody has, we are recording this. Um, I will add that information to the images because, unfortunately, Tom didn't notate uh, most of his images. So anything that you can add to the historical record, please do. Rockingham, uh, New Hampshire, well, Rockingham or Rockingham Junction, um, October 1984, the Portsmouth local B&M 1562 GP7 on the connection track at Rockingham. And then coming onto the main line there with the uh, Western Route Main. And a really nice shot uh, showing the Jeep on the connection track. Uh, the diamond in the line to Manchester would have been in the background there. The diamond was removed in 1977. Uh, this is 1984, so the Portsmouth branch from Rockingham to East Manchester was abandoned at this point in time. Um, but the last couple of years they were running trains on the Portsmouth branch. Uh, west of here, they actually would use the other connection track to get to access uh, Portsmouth since the diamond was removed in 77. They did a couple high and wides that, that did that. Gardner, Massachusetts. This is processed June 1985. Kind of a neat shot here. Uh, you get some MBTA, you get the B&M, and you get the Providence and Worcester as well. 1562, once again, B&M GP7. 
Tom has an extensive collection of MBTA stuff. Unfortunately, I have not started the MBTA stuff yet. That's going to be quite a haul when I get to it. Um, you might see some MBTA mixed in with the B&M, but this is pretty much all B&M photographs. Ask question about that. Why would the MBTA be in Gardner? They service the guy for Were they still? They yeah. Service first? Yeah. 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 First couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Early 1980. There were more people traveling on the weekend than during the week, mm -hmm. which was unusual for commuter rail. Sure. And ultimately, the thing that ended it was uh, after Guilford left the contract with the, uh, with the uh, MBTA drop, MBTA went out and got Amtrak, and the Guilford would not allow them to go west of Fitchburg, Water Street and Fitchburg, which was the end of MBTA ownership. They got Wilson bus lines to run a substitute operation for a period of time, and then it just went away. Mm -hmm. Once again, back up to Bellows Falls, uh, August 1st, 1966. Uh, this is a really, really nice shot, a northbound Con River job with 1563 in the lead. Uh, it looks like 1568 behind it and uh, 1505 15, behind that. 1563, interestingly enough, um, held onto its large uh, water tanks while a lot of the other Jeeps did, had those removed. Um, but this is 1966. Mm. 1566 um, in Ayer, Massachusetts. This is October 1983. I always thought this was one of the catchiest paint schemes the B&M had, um, combining the early 70s blue dip with the late 70s uh, quote-unquote Dustin era lettering on the long hood and the bell of course in the front high mounted yeah and the nice thing about the B&M paint schemes is you can tell pretty much exactly when they were taken based yeah. on the schemes that they're in um, as you can see 1566 has had the water tanks removed so you have kind of that open space under the uh, the sill there Waltham, Massachusetts, local B01. This is June of 1984. We have 1567 um, as the local there in Waltham. Obviously, there's uh, no freight there today. It's all. That, uh, caboose on the river track. The river track? Yep. Another shot of 1567 there in Waltham. Um, Nelligan took a quite, quite a bit of photos in the Waltham area and specifically on the Central Mass. Uh, branch, but also um, on the Bemis branch as well. So some of that will show up in here. We worked in Waltham for oh, yep. most of this time up here. Oh, in the technology mm -hmm. sector. Yep. Um, I don't know if this is the Bemis branch or the or the Central Mass. Um, if anybody does, but this is definitely a branch in Waltham. This is the same day, same local. B01. Uh, B01 served both branches. Um, I have a feeling this might be the Bemis branch, but I'm not quite sure on that. Of course, the Bemis branch was originally part of the Watertown branch. It was severed, became two, two separate branches. That might be Newton Street in Waltham. Newton Street, would that, which branch would that be? That would be the Bemis. The Bemis, Bemis branch. <coughs> Linfield on the Newburyport branch. This is uh, July 1984. We have 1567 uh, heading out on the Newburyport branch uh, with one of the um, New Haven style cabooses, the NE5 cabooses that the B&M had being flagged there. Does it give out town? Is this Whitefield? Linfield? Oh, it's Linfield. Linfield, yeah. Once again, uh, in Linfield on the Newburyport branch. Air Massachusetts, obviously brand new painted 1702 GP9. Uh, this is October 1981 when the Imron Blue uh, dust and era dips started to kind of take effect 1980, 1981, 1979 in that general period. The story I've heard is they went to black around the bottom because it hit the dirt better. Makes sense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think this might have been the unit that was torched during the strike in White River Junction. Um, not certain on that, but I know one of the Jeeps was, and I think it was the 1702. One thing that Nelligan covered extensively was the B&M's expansion into central Connecticut in the early 1980s. He actually wrote an article in the B&M Bulletin, I believe it was in the winter 1982-1983 issue, 
uh, with Scott Hartley about uh, the expansion into central Connecticut. It's a great, great account of that whole situation. Uh, a lot of his pictures show up in that article, but now we have the color versions. Uh, this is Beacon Falls, Connecticut. This is local WA1, the Waterbury, Connecticut local. This is taken in June 1984, showing some of the business that the BNM picked up uh, from the formal Conrail property down in Connecticut. A lot of that's still operated by Pan Am and now CSX. Uh, this is Ansonia, Connecticut, same day, same train, local WA1, uh, showing some of that Amtrak service that was in the area as well. He goes into, in the article, he goes into detail about what the B&M got, what they couldn't get, what Conrail kept and what Amtrak kept and all of that. Uh, it's a really, really great piece. So we do have that available. Um, they have that issue available for purchase on our website. Um, I believe it was winter 82, 83. Um, but yeah, nice, nice piece of writing by Tom and Scott for sure. I think that's an SPV 2000, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a bud. That is a bud car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not too. Not too popular, I guess. No. Never heard anybody call an SPV 2000 a bud car. That's, yeah. That's not correct. <laughs> no. The bud cars ran. Right, that's right. <laughs> but those were built by bud. Yeah. Yes, they were. Yeah. Bud. Doesn't make them a bud. A bud car in name, but not in reputation. <laughs> right. Uh, South Deerfield on the Con River, the southern portion of the Con River out of Deerfield, uh, south to Springfield, trained CPSP in November of 1983. A couple of those blue dip Jeeps leading some piggyback freight. Tom also spent a lot of time on the Con River, uh, specifically between Deerfield and Springfield. Nice series of pictures here that Tom got in uh, eastern New Hampshire. This is Dover, New Hampshire, June 21st, 1985. We have a full date for this series. Train BODO, Boston to Dover. Um, interestingly enough, combining both the gravel traffic with the regular traffic uh, for Rochester. So these B&M boxcars here are probably for Davis and Rubber in, in Farmington. Uh, they got a lot of B&M 50-foot boxcars. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting picture because it's a complete, as far as we can see, it's a completely B&M consist here. Uh, and I always liked the white number boards in the 1712. I thought that was kind of neat. Another shot, diff slightly different angle, showing what was left of Dover Yard in the mid-80s. And once again, another shot in Dover. Three units on that train on this day. Kind of an interesting angle from the other side here. It looks like they've got quite a few boxcars. Um, Davidson would get a, a significant amount of cars at once, uh, and this is quite a quite an emblematic shot of that. Following the train up the line, uh, this is in Rochester, New Hampshire, uh, coming up on the split between the Farmington branch and the Conway branch. Well, continuation of the Conway branch. Yeah, that's Portland Street. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Rochester. Yep, my grandparents lived on. Um, Wakefield Street, <laughs> off the Farmington. We had the Farmington branch in their front yard and the Conway branch in their backyard. <laughs> I was uh, always jealous of my mom. When I, I went to Spalding and it was tough, and, and on certain parts of the building, you could literally see both branches. And at, at, you know, in the early 80s, there was still traffic on sure. the Farmington branch and the Conway branch. Yeah. I got yelled at a lot. <laughs> <laughs> As would I. <laughs> now the nice. Staring at the window of trains. Oh, yeah. Quite a bit of traffic, too, even on the Farmington branch back then. Um, another shot at Rochester there. And this is up in Milton on the Conway branch. You can see they've dropped the rest of their freight in Rochester, and they've taken just the hoppers up towards Ossipee Pit. Of course, this is still in service today and quite nicely operated by New Hampshire North Coast. It's also a dangerous location to stand. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, not a lot of options there. Railroad road and that's it. <coughs> Heading across the causeway there, just north of that spot. Now interestingly enough, you look at a photo like this and you're thinking, wow, three Jeeps, lots of cars, they must have been flying. No, they weren't flying. <laughs> Russell Monroe shot some Super 8 of these trains in the early 80s. Uh, we released it as a VHS tape back in the 90s and hopefully someday we'll redo it as either a YouTube video for rent or purchase or a DVD. And these trains were crawling. Uh, this, this branch was not well maintained at this point in time. There were two crews from Dover to get up. Oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty rough. Really nice shot here. 
uh, the wigwag, one of the very last wigwags in service on the B&M, on the Conway branch. Uh, one of the other ones was in Milford on the Hillsboro. Yeah, Yep. Yep. When, when it hit the list, I remember there was quite a consternation among some people. Went, what do you mean there are a lot of abandoned yeah. lines? It's all that gravel crap. Well, if you read the abandonment documents, yeah, they mention a lot of branches that survived as being potential abandonments. Yeah. Those are the battery boxes in the foreground? Um, I would think so, yeah. Oh, well, they got the battery wells, too. I don't know which one it would have drawn from. Yeah, the concrete. Yeah. Concrete. Yeah. yeah that yep. Either that or uh, left over where they used to carry. Uh, Probably all gone but they used to have the same thing to keep gas in for the motor cars. So they all Oh, really? Yeah. No kidding. When I was a kid, the Stone Branch, they had a wig, uh, wig wag. Yeah. Yep. I asked an old time, I was only about 10 or 12, I said, how come they got these little things, uh, these little wells or something? Yeah. That's where the railroad hides all their money. <laughs> <laughs> did, did the one in Milford get saved? It's in the archives, and yeah, it's, we have it. Yep. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, when Gilbert took it down, they just cut it up. They so removed it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's yep. We have it in storage. Yeah. yeah, we have it. Yep. It was removed carefully. Yep. There's still some telltales in Nashville, too. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Samnerville, New Hampshire. Uh, the old station, well, second station. Uh, the larger station was torn down quite a while before this. Um, coming up to where the Wolfboro branch used to join off. Take a jump out to East Deerfield. This is in June of 1984. Kind of a nice shot here. Uh, two Jeeps leaving the yard. Um, and uh, SW9 on the left with the Canadian National Caboose, one of the Point St. Charles uh, vans. Probably would have come in on a CV job. This is down at Ayer on the Hollis Branch lead. Uh, this is October 1981. Brand new Imron paint on 1720. Uh, GP9. The Hollis branch um, from Ayrd and to Pepperell was abandoned 82. So this is probably, I, I would imagine this is just sitting there. It's probably not the Hollis local uh, at this point. It's full of and storage. Storage, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are some pictures of the, the Hollis branch in here later on. Um, White River Junction, of course, this is. Uh, b and MCP pool job, June 1984. Two Jeeps and uh, C424, number 4204, uh, 42 CP rail. Really nice shot. Tom spent, like I said, a lot of time on the Con River, uh, which was quite busy at this point in time. Um, a lot of trains running. You had CV, CP, b and m b and MCP pool jobs, Amtrak, locals. Um, we have an interview actually on our website, one of our podcast episodes with an engineer, um, Mike Bump, who grew up in Claremont. And um, he talks about how busy the line was back then. Crossing the Sugar River in West Claremont, New Hampshire, the High Bridge. Really nice shot. Most of the trains that go through here are um, hard to shoot now. Um, when I was... Spending a little bit of time out that way, we would try to chase them, but a lot of them ran at night, so it was pretty hard to get shots now, but every once in a while you can get a high, nice daytime shot here. Brattleboro. The train again coming th on the Con River. This is coming into Brattleboro with the, um, the old station platform there. Brattleboro was kind of unique that it had an elevated walkway that crossed the tracks um, when passenger service was still operating. East Northfield, another interesting location. Uh, this is at one point where the northbound main line of the Con River branched off through the field to the right, crossed the river into New Hampshire, and ran up on the New Hampshire side until coming back in again at Brattleboro and joining up with the southbound main. Uh, that was the situation until about 1970 when one of the bridge alignments here was knocked out of place uh, by ice. And um, all the northbound and southbound traffic just used this line up to Brattleboro. Of course, they kept the section in New Hampshire to access Keene until about 1984. This didn't have a location. Um, I imagine if we looked hard enough, we could figure it out. Schenectady Chemical, that's what the tower says. Rotterdam? Rotterdam? Schenectady. Beautiful. 
thank you. Uh, 1733 was the last GP9 in the McGinnis paint scheme. Um, so it was kind of a hot button topic for a lot of people. They wanted to shoot this engine. And it has these uh, orange step wells, which was done in like 79, 78 as a safety initiative and yard service. Uh, that was done away with relatively quickly, but we can date this in 1980. Uh, they still had the orange step wells in 1980. And this engine was repainted in 1981. Um, in his interview, Mike talks about how one night as a kid, he went down to the junction, Claremont Junction, and got this engine coming north in B&M McGinnis. And like two nights later, it came up in brand new Imron Blue. I remember that when the uh, MP33 Ron Nash was on the lower end of the hill for a branch about 1980. Yep. Right. The place I worked was right near the railroad track, so the, the, the time was right. I was happy standing out the door when the train went by. But sure. Two yep. or three days a week ran by that time. Down in Waterbury, Connecticut. Um, again, this is where Tom was from, uh, Connecticut, so he spent a lot of time. Uh, getting the B&M in Connecticut, which uh, a lot of people didn't shoot the B&M in Connecticut, um, at least um, to the extent and publicly that we know that Tom did. Uh, so he has a lot of nice shots in Waterbury, but right before the Guilford takeover. Interestingly enough, in the article, Tom talks about how uh, Guilford was actually involved with the B&M while the B&M was still independent. Uh, they were, the talk to, to do the merger and everything was already happening when the B&M took over the Connecticut uh, territory. So some people have theorized over the years that uh, possibly that was something the B&M did uh, with Guilford, you know, in, in talks to build up business before the takeover. Um, but like 81, 82 was when that whole thing was going on. Interesting shot at Ayer. Um, this is 1183 when this was processed. 1742 um, seems to have had some doors replaced because the lettering is completely absent from the, the long hood of the engine. Again, we have no information as to why. I'm sure there's a record somewhere, but um, kind of an interesting shot. Rigby Yard, South Portland, Maine. Now, this is an earlier shot. This is a color slide from June of 1969. A couple of Jeeps, uh, looks like four Jeeps, right by PT Tower, which was just rebuilt. Uh, Westboro, New Hampshire, West Lebanon. The yard there at the end of the northern Maine. Uh, big power facility closed in 1972, but we see three RS3s and an F7B, 4265B. Um, interestingly enough, the B&M didn't usually run the F units as continuous sets. They often ran the A, the A units alone and the B units alone, um, wedged between other first generation power. Uh, so you have a great example of that here. The northern was famous for that, and you'll see some more of that later on. Back down to Ayer, uh, this is specifically train EDSA, East Deerfield to Somerville, I believe. Salem. Salem? Salem. Salem. Um, Via Lowell. Via Lowell, yep, February 1984. A couple of the rebuilt 1800s, actually three of the 1800s. Uh, the B&M started a program to rebuild the GP9s with um, more powerful power assemblies, I think? 645 power assemblies. Is that right? They, they bolt right into, it's a balance issue. So yep. They did a number of them. They didn't do all of them. I, I, I believe they had plans to do all of them, um, but it didn't happen because Guilford took over. Um, but these engines, a lot of the GP9s that survived into Pan Am and Guilford service were the 1800s because they were, you know, more updated. So, a nice shot of EDSA here. Um, he has this listed as Somerville in September of 1985. Uh, this is crazy to me because I was born in 1995, and the fact that just 10 years before I was born, there was, you know, road freight in and out of Boston um, kind of blows my mind. <laughs> but nice, nice sunset shot here by Tom. Yeah, it disappeared like a 20 year period. Real busy though. Yeah. Kind of like the, what I read in San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, did the same thing, same time frame. Yeah, I mean, even a place like Manchester, it was pretty rapid. Yeah. You know. Yeah. This is Bernardston on the Con River, local ED4 with a brand new painted 1751 GP18. A really nice shot. He got a nice series of this local um, from <laughs> Bernardston up to Brattleboro in 1182. And this is Shirley, trained BASE. Uh, this is October 1984. Quite a bit of tonnage there behind four Jeeps. Lunenburg, just west of Shirley. Lunenburg? Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Thank you. 
Um, rock cut, East Deerfield. This is train EDSP, um, November of 86. Another GP18. Is that part of the East Deerfield Loop? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Interesting shot here. Uh, this is Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, train EDCO, East Deerfield to Concord, if you can believe it. Uh, March of 1985. Uh, in July of 1985, New England Southern took over from Concord to Manchester, and so EDCO was abolished and became EDMA for a short period of time. Um, but just one engine on this day, Manchester Yard, the yard office is still there. That was torn down 1986 or 7, not too long after this. And then up in Concord, EDCO in Concord, um, what's left of Concord Yard, right before New England Southern took over um, in 1985. They took over July 12th, I think, 1985, somewhere around there. Like the week before... Um, Guilford came in and scrapped pretty much the whole yard in Concord. So there wasn't a lot left to work with. Haverhill, Massachusetts, crossing uh, the Merrimack River here. Uh, get into the GP38s now. Uh, you can probably, <laughs> probably tell these are arranged by file number because we've gone by engine type to engine type. Uh, GP38-2, number 202, and then GP7. It looks like 1567 there behind it. And I think there's a DNH engine behind that. The rail were added by the yep. yep. Nice series of shots here. Um, I said earlier that when EDCO was abolished, it became EDMA. Uh, so here, this is 1987, eight years before I was born, and they're running road freights into Manchester. <laughs> uh, this is at the Willows in Ayer, GP38 on the lead. 1741 uh, was just purchased by the 470 Club. It's up at North Conway. They're going to repaint it. Uh, and get it operating. I think they're going to put it in the McGinnis scheme, hopefully. Nashua, leaving Nashua. Uh, once again, this is May 1987, EDMA, that's East Deerfield to Manchester, leaving Nashua Yard. That's the Hillsborough branch to the right. Head out to Gardner, Mass., October 6, 1979. We have an eastbound unit coal train um, behind quite a bit of power there coming through Gardner. Uh, this is, yeah, October 1979. Lawrence, three GP 38s, oh no, two 38s and a, thir and a 40, looks like, in, in the middle. This is train, not listed. Somebody probably knows. <laughs> the slug set in Lowell, this is train MERU. In July of 1983, the, the slug set. Um, usually it was two, two 40s and a slug, but we have a 38, a 40, and a slug here. Uh, the slug number 100 was built from a GP9 that was purchased from the Union Pacific, I think. And for a while, though, the counterweight, the, the, the slug was scrapped, but the concrete counterweight was sitting in East Deerfield Yard, uh, right by the, the tower there. I don't know if it's still there, but it was there recently. Back out on the Bemis branch, this is local B01 in July of 1984. The B&M, the GP40 showed up in 1977-78. Um, they were used primarily in road service, although you will see some shots from 1979 or 1980 where the odd GP40 showed up on a local freight. Uh, we have a great shot in 1979 of a, of a GP40 on the Goffstown branch. Um, it was on train EDCO, and the local crew out of Concord took it off the road freight and put it on the, the Goffstown freight. Um, this is a little later than that. This is 1984, so the 40s started to, to leak into local freight service around this time. I think they're switching a cold storage warehouse that was out that way. One of these shots appeared um, in his book, Bluebirds and Minutemen, a uh, different angle of this same shot. And then crossing the trestle that was on the Bemis branch, or one of, one of two trestles that was on the Bemis branch, rather. Would this have been the Charles River? Yeah, crossed yeah. it twice. Two twice. Trestles, yep. And they're both gone now. Yep. Toilet. Down in Lowell, uh, this is right by the uh, Transportation Center, train MERU, uh, with a DNH engine there as well. 
This was taken in 1983, July 1983. Right after the Guilford takeover, actually. Yep. Literally, literally right after. Uh, train EDSA. This is... Um, that's low. Yep. Of course, this is North Chelmsford, uh, the Stony Brook. This is April of 1982. A couple shots of uh, GP40s here now, so we're getting into the 40s. An interesting shot. Tom, of course, he went to school in Boston, so he spent a lot of time shooting freight in and around Boston um, as it was starting to go away. This is um, December 1984, BNM 316. <clears throat> he didn't just shoot. Uh, contemporary shots on the B&M. He shot a lot of um, B&M remnants as well. This is Hillsboro, New Hampshire, one of the covered bridges on the Hillsboro branch. Uh, this is the bridge over the um, Katookook River there in Hillsboro. Well, yeah, this was taken September 1984. It burned not long after that. Um, it was an arson. But the branch hadn't been used the, the tracks between Bennington and Hillsborough hadn't been used since January of 1973. They were abandoned formally in 1979, so, yeah. Inside the bridge. See, the rails are, rails are still there. The rails stayed in place for a little while, and they were pulled up in the early to mid-80s. Yeah, this Classic shot of the um, facade there at North Station, uh, Tom took a lot of shots of the facade at North Station. Pretty nice. Uh, they have replicated this at the new bar down there, uh, Banners. If you, if you ever eat there, they have a replica of this with the Boston and Main Railroad uh, lettering. It's, it's all on one line. It's not two lines like this, but it, it's... I was pleasantly surprised to see that. It's really nice. Yeah, I was really pleasantly surprised. Yeah, and they have all the, the stonework and everything exactly the same. Yeah. It's really neat. A little bit earlier, this is February 1969, Mount Whittier, uh, West Ossipee, New Hampshire. Uh, one of the railroad enthusiast snow train trips up to North Conway. Yeah, a lot of snow. <laughs> um, I don't know because they do. There are shots of them in North Conway. I think that was a few years earlier. That looks like old snow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was the 1700 and the, and the Jordan spreader derailed in one of these trips, right, literally right down the track <laughs> from here, and they couldn't go any further. Yeah, up here, North Conway. Quite, a, quite an assortment of RDCs, including a uh, RDC-3 there. Rick, are these 35 millimeter, or are they medium format? Uh, they're 35, yep. This one is? Mm-hmm. His slides are all, 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 all 35. Um, I'm still trying to identify a set of two and a quarter, two and a Yeah, some of the square ones are different. Um, the negatives are of a wide variety of formats, um, but the slides are pretty uniform. Um, another shot at North Conway. Pretty unmistakable. And that caboose was there for quite a while. It might even still be there. I don't know. North Adams, Massachusetts. This is a uh, Alco S4, 3? S3? Yeah. Um, North Adams in 1969. Nice shot at East Cambridge, um, February 1986. Again, still had freight business in Boston. Saw it a switcher in Boston uh, that late in the game. This was an interesting shot. I thought at first it might be Lawrence, but it's, it's Holyoke, Massachusetts. Yeah, SW1. See if anybody can place this shot. Yeah, that's Lawrence. Yep. Right at the junction. Yep. Yeah, all gone. This is 19... Uh, 84, September. Well, that was processing date. It could be earlier. Uh, this is also Lowell, I think. Yep. 
And I think the, the abutment for the old bridge over the yard would be right back behind there. Where it came over? Yep. Yep. SW8806. Uh, th these engines were interesting. They were purchased mostly for the hump yard in Somerville. Um, and later on, they kind of fanned out onto the B&M system. Uh, they didn't go terribly far, although they did show up in some interesting places. Um, in New Hampshire, they showed up in Manchester a lot, Concord occasionally. Uh, they were on the M&L a lot. They were on uh, the branches out of Ayer quite a bit. Uh, they had a really good tractive effort. Um, they could pull on, on level track very effectively, and so that's one of the reasons that the B&M pur purchased them for the hump yard. Down in East Deerfield, October 1985, 1220. Uh, still in B&M paint, looking pretty rough at this point in time. With the yellow lettering too, that's kind of an interesting modeler's note there. Nice series of shots here with 1223 not in its original B&M paint. This was repainted, I believe it was funded by the Amherst Railway Society. Is that, is that the story with it? Um, it was repainted, I think it was repainted around um, 1980, thereabouts, because this is a little later than that. Uh, this is 1987 on the Watertown branch, out of Cambridge. Another shot of the um, <clears throat> 1223. Quincy and Market in the background. Lovely Santa Fe Oscar. Yeah, isn't that neat? I always like the shock controls. This is also on the branch, the Watertown branch. Interesting shot here. This is 1228 SW9, uh, September 1982. This engine's still around. It was owned by the Milford Bennington uh, Railroad. There's an effort to, to restore the engine. So a couple dedicated volunteers are chipping away at it. Uh, they just put a control stand in it that came out of um, the North, New Hampshire North Coast Jeep that was up at North Conway. Uh, so they're doing some work on it. They can bar it over, but um, they need some um, gaskets before they can start the engine. But it still has the high number boards and everything, so classic B&M. Waltham on the Central Mass Branch. I included these shots because this trackage was just torn up a couple months ago. Um, they've converted the Central Mass into a rail trail from the 95 overpass all the way up to this point. Um, as far as I know, they're going to keep the bridge in place. Rick could probably speak to that. The little 128 bridge, I Are they going to keep this one, do you know? I believe so. Yeah. So the bottom end has been paid too now? Um, because, I mean, from 128, well, just a little bit from 128, yep. to uh, Wayland has been paid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're working on the Waltham section now. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. if they haven't already paved it, they're going to. I think they're going to go across. The yeah, they're going to leave that in. Yep. And continue right on into Walmart. Yep. So. And I think this is Clematis Brook, is that right? Yeah. Yep. This is where the, uh, the Central Mash came in with the, uh, the Fitchburg there. Uh, yeah, this was just, they just removed the tracks here too. Um, but they kept a couple hundred feet of the turnout where it, left, where it leaves the main. So. For, for the stuff. Is that, yep? Yeah, don't, don't use it very often. But they cool. Good to know. Yep. Does anybody know, now this is something I was wondering, does anybody know how late they would have been running over this bridge? <clears throat> nice shot here. This is Woburn, the very last day of service on the Woburn Loop. Yeah. I used to train uh, before I just got my license. Yep. It was a record shop for Beacon Hill, my buddy and I would go to. So we'd drive to Woburn and take the flight yeah. into, uh, in fact, I got my uh, cab ride there. Yeah. Oh, on the, on the Woburn? The first trip we made it. Yeah. Yeah. I told my grandfather was an engineer at the there you go. That's how you get it. Going to the yard. This was about 1970. It was uh, 73. And the line, it looked like a line-out catalog. I just couldn't believe it. I was used to roll yard. Yeah. And this thing's like, you know, 10 times bigger. Right. Oh, i got to come back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think this was the end of the line at this point. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. Wilmington. Wilmington, yep. Yeah, there's a little stub that still runs. Yep. Oh, the cement plant up there? Yeah. Yep. Cement 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 no more? No. More? no. Yep. So this is 1981. We're getting into his negatives now. That's the uh, the the loop. Yep. yep. No. This is the last day of service on the loop. I didn't know that was a mammoth station. <laughs> um, his negatives aren't aren't dated exactly. 
Um, I know that this date is well known, but um, from now, from here on out, it'll be mostly years that we'll be talking about. Uh, this is 1969 Manchester Yard, the pig yard, the piggy backyard. Not the largest piggy backyard on the B&M, but from what I've been told, the most efficient piggy backyard on the B&M. They had it down to a science. The old gas holder building in the background. And uh, if you were standing here today, you'd be standing in the outfield of the Fisher Cats ballpark. Uh, this is the engine service track in Manchester. SW1 and an uh, S5M. A couple switchers for the uh, trick jobs, the trick switchers in Manchester, which worked the three branches out of Manchester. Which in 1969, all three of them would still have been in service. 1969. This is uh, obviously Boston Engine Terminal in uh, East Somerville. Really neat place in that period of time where you could get a lot of B&M freight and passenger power all in one place. Inside the engine house at BET, Tom got access to get in and take a picture of uh, the 4265 F7A. Other on the table. This is Reading, Massachusetts, local freight, 1564, and one of the flat top buggies. Interesting anecdote, um, society used to meet in this station quite a number of years ago for their meetings. Clematis Brook, back out on the Central Mass branch in Waltham, local freight, cab indicator signal. This is also 1969. Tom, Tom's negatives are interesting because if you look at the negative strips um, and you line them up numerically, you can tell where he went on his trips, on his time off from school. Uh, sometimes he'll start and get two or three shots in Somerville, then the next shots will be in Manchester, then the next shots will be in Concord, then White River. Uh, so you can kind of follow him geographically throughout his travels, um, you know, doing rail fan trips. Of course, there was a heck of a lot more to see back then, so you could do stuff like that. This is up in Westboro, yeah, West Lebanon, uh, northern job here. I think that's 4268, yep. All, th all, all three of these F units, the 65, the 66, and the 68, uh, they all got really wildly different versions of the, uh, the blue dip paint scheme. Uh, Dave Hutchinson's kind of documented which ones got what, um, and I think it was the 65 that got the worst of it, um, just totally beat up. But these engines were retired finally. I, I think the 68 was the last one in service in 75. So. Those headlights? I would, yeah, I would say maybe. Yeah, just illuminating it, yep. You can't really tell too well with the projector, but the stars are visible, so it's a really nice night, night shot. Yeah. Pull your, pull your car up and use the yeah. <laughs> Useful application of, uh, of ambient light. We had to do a lot of that when I was in, in school because a lot of it was at night. Back down at Somerville, uh, this is 69, I think. Yeah, because the 4228 is still in service. F3A, affectionately dubbed Patches. By a <laughs> yeah, Patches, yeah. Another shot. Uh, this engine was used extensively on passenger service until about 66, 67, when the B&M did away with its longer distance passenger trains. After that, it pretty much relegated to freight, but it did freight in the early 60s too, so. Yeah, that was BJ, BJ3, there's some shots of that later on, yep. Inside the engine house, RS3 and a GP9. And again, outside of the engine house, another great example of the B&M's F units being uh, parceled out and used individually rather than uh, as a unit. I think the 4267 was the last F anything that was in service. That was in service in about 1978, and it was pretty commonly used on the, uh, the Ossipee gravel trains, uh, sandwiched between GP18s or GP9s. And uh, somebody told me that when they would run that thing from Ossipee to Dover, by the time it got to Dover, it'd be leaking all over the place. Um, and so it was, it was stored at Bill Ricca for a while, and it's actually still around. It's down in Pennsylvania. 
um, the anthracite group down there has it painted up in Lackawanna paint. Another nice ambient night shot up at White River Junction, 1752 with the uh, Minuteman Herald on the nose. We talked a little bit earlier about the uh, Hollis branch out of Ayer up to Pepperell, remnant of the uh, Worcester, Nashua, and Portland main line. This is um, around Groton, Massachusetts on the Pepperell branch, or the Hollis branch rather. Probably more accurately called the Pepperell branch because I don't know how often they went to Hollis. But um, interesting, pretty identifiable too because of this power line that ran along the tracks. We have a 1230, it's an SW9, kind of rocking its way through the weeds there. I think that, was that James River up in Pepperell? The big Pe paper. Pepperell paper? Yeah. I think it's changed names a couple times. Yeah. Trust Most of them did, yeah. And yeah, they brought gas under the Hollis too. Yep. Gas. Right at the end of track? Yeah. Yep. Another nice shot. Pretty emblematic of the B&M's branch lines in the 70s. Um, you know, after the bankruptcy and even before the bankruptcy, uh, maintenance on some of these branch lines was, was not a priority due to the revenue and uh, the, the financial structure of the railroad, so. Lack of income. Yeah. But most of those lines probably hardly covered their crew costs to operate. Oh yeah, and you look at like lines like the Portsmouth branch, they were going 25 miles with one car to Epping with five crew members. Yeah. You know, it's. It's almost as bad as Little Rock. Yeah. Little Rock Island, we had two locomotives, one car to lose six guys. <laughs> right. Rock Island yeah. Line. Yeah. Uh, the other branch out of air, the Greenville branch, ran up at this time as far as Townsend, Massachusetts. There was a box company in Townsend. Uh, this is 1727 on the local. This is probably around West Groton, maybe near Squanacook Junction, somewhere around there. Yeah. Just. Just pretty, pretty. I mean, this could be any number of B&M branches yeah. around so, that time. Uh, Fred Bailey in the book with John Krause, um, Trains of Northern New England was making comments about, you know, those branch lines were largely responsible for the bank issue of Boston and Maine. Yeah, and you know, it, it's true too. And I was reading through the abandonment documents uh, for the Portsmouth branch. 19, they tried to abandon it like six times in the 70s. Oh, yeah. And you know, Dustin and, and, and the trustees, they wanted to get rid of it, and it makes sense because they were losing money. So. You know, in 77, they posted these. There's a white flag editorial on the subject besides Trains of Northern New England's comment. Yeah. And they are called the Category 1 lines, which was blatant money losers. And the Category 2 lines are the ones that probably didn't really lose money operationally, but they weren't generating any of the money to pay to fix things. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, again, these flat top buggies were pretty common on the locals around air. Uh, short distance locals. Uh, West Concord, the diamonds between the Fitchburg division and the New Haven, and well, at this point in time, be Penn Central's uh, Framingham secondary or the Framingham and Lowell line. Uh, I've lost my place in, in the listings here. I think this is 71. Yeah. Yeah, we, we shot a video, we shot a Minuteman Tales out here uh, a couple months ago. It hasn't aired yet. Um, but yeah, the tracks, the, the, the Framingham and Lowell. In, in, well, yeah, I mean, they were still running this on the line. <laughs> you know? Montreal was running up to Chelmsford in, 19, in the early 80s. Yeah. Yeah, they set out a red pig. They severed the line right. in Chelmsford Street. Yeah, GP30s in, in, in this part of New England, pretty rare, but... Yeah, they ran up to Lowell. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Tom got a lot of stuff on the Framingham and Lowell. A lot of stuff. Whereabouts in that line was this picture I, I don't know. It's not labeled. This is either near South Sudbury or West Concord. Um, but there are interchange tracks here. I think this might be a southbound freight just north of the Diamond with the connection tracks with the B&M here. That'd be my guess. Because it's the same day as this shot. Yeah, it had to be. Uh, there was a big customer. Yeah, so he might have just turned around. He might have just turned around and got that that shot. Um, yes. Waiting for waiting for the diamond to clear. Yeah. That was an unusual uh, custom. Both B and M and Conrail or Penn Central serviced them, mm -hmm. and it was common once or twice a year to tie onto the empties Penn Central and take them to Framingham for the more hours. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Yeah. 
But yeah, that was an interesting location uh, for sure. The the two railroads in close proximity. Yep. Yep. You can kind of feel the heat. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Lowell. Sixty-two oh six RDC two. Yeah, those of you who are not Penn Central fans, just back on that GP thirty shot. The red P is pretty hard to find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. two thirty two is one. Yep. Red orange. Um, that's the end of the, uh, right yeah. The yeah, that's where it came in. I heard from somebody that they might be reactivating some of that to go to a scrap company. Uh, yeah, maybe in the in the coming years. Yeah. 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 They tore up the rails. I think within the last two years on most of that. You have to go to Industrial Avenue. Well, actually. Brought it down to where the Sears Plaza was. I yep. Know what's in there now. Yep. But beyond that, I believe the tracks are still in place. So it's like a mile of it. Yeah, I know they tore up the rails by the the, the weighing towers there. So. And all they use that for now is the track patrol. That's where they sit on or get off. Yep. Hmm. Yep. It's actually a wire there, too. It's another way. Yeah. Yep. This is uh, back down in Somerville inside the engine house, GP7. Uh, the GP7s, you know, they started to get pretty ratty uh, at this point in time, but the ones that didn't get repainted uh, were good runners because usually engines would go in for paint same time they went in for repairs. Uh, this is 15, 1558 inside the engine house. I think this is the engine that was almost completely gold at one point because <laughs> all the maroon had, wo had worn off of it. Yeah. But a really good, really good indication that they painted them gold before they put the maroon on. Uh, yeah, Beverly Draw. And this is a B and M MBTA commuter. Uh, interestingly enough, these shots here um, show the 1569, which had a bud card decal applied to the long hood. Kind of unusual. Yeah, this would be before the fire. Uh, this is 19. 78? Yeah. Yeah, 1978. Yep. Keen, 1978. S3 in the yard, B&M S3. Um, at this point in time, it would have been the Green Mountain Railroad switching Keen using uh, B&M Power. Later on, they got the whole Ashwilat branch from Brattleboro to Keen. But at this point in time, it was still B&M into Keen and Green Mountain switching Keen. Uh, northbound, BJ3, uh, East Andover, 1969. There's that 4228 in freight service. Interesting combination here. You got a 4228A and one of the F7Bs and then an RS3. Pretty common on the northern main line um, around this period of time. 1969, November. It was all done in 73. Although there's a great series of photographs that was taken by um, Eric Hartz. Early 1973, I think it was January 1973, one of the very last road freights from Boston White River Junction had a fort had an F, F A F B F A lash up, all in dip blue, and uh, pretty lucky, <laughs> pretty lucky. Further along in Andover on the Northern Main, and then uh, leaving Potter Place, you can see the Potter Place station in the background. Uh, heading up the northern, 1969. And then heading away from the camera. Line's still in pretty good shape at this point in time. This is one of the very late 50s. Late 50s? Yeah, I think they did. Right? I think they derailed the late 50s. Maybe when they put the, the CTC in, yeah. yeah. What was that? This is while he was in college? Yes. He was in college from 68 to 75. So... Road trip. Saint graduate? Or was that the seven-year program? <laughs> Must be, yeah, because he went to law school. Law school. Law school. Yep. Yep. Southbound CP rail job in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Uh, F unit on the lead, pretty classy. And on the same day, he got a derailed St. Johnsbury and Lamoille County freight, 
in St. Johnsbury. And if that combine looks familiar to anybody, it's because it's the one that's in Lowell. That was uh, sold to the St. Johnsbury in Lamoille County. They had it for a number of years. Uh, it's now our exhibit down in Lowell. Yeah. <laughs> None at all. Yeah. 4265A uh, in the engine, ho uh, engine house, <laughs> the engine shop at Bill Ricca. And uh, F3A 4228, very end of service for this engine. It wasn't in service much longer. I always thought this would have been nice if it had been saved, but no such luck. Pilot's a little dented too, if you notice. Yeah, it's seen some. Seen, <laughs> but it does have it does have uh, it does have some character to it. Uh, yeah, it's the guts of a GP9 being worked on. Uh, no, wait a minute, that's a switcher. Yep, that's a switcher. You can see the hood off to the left. Um, or is that a Jeep? Yeah, that's a Jeep. Yep. Yep. You don't see a whole lot of shots inside Bill Ricca uh, shops. So it's nice that Tom was able to get these. Now, this is the 6148. It's now up at the Winnipesaukee Scenic uh, Hobo Railroad. I don't know what happened to it. It was in some sort of wreck here. And it's interesting that they've got the New Haven parts um, on hand. There was an RDC that was running around for a while in B&M paint that had an, a New Haven door on it. So I'm wondering if this is the same unit. They, they sold, I mean, the New Haven had any number of, of uh, accident yeah. involved RDCs. Just cut it up and send it up. Send it up to the B&M, yeah. 6117. Uh, we have actually a really interesting, we have an interesting recording. It was a VHS tape that was taken um, with Don Hills, Preston Johnson, and Don Robinson. And uh, that's going to make its way onto YouTube in the next few weeks. But he talks about a, a collision between two B&M Bud cars in the late 60s, early 70s. So I'm wondering if this is the same situation. The close-up of patches there. Yeah. Down at North Station. Um, this might be 1969. Uh, when they had the big snow plow extra in in the station itself, kind of need to see freight power and a snow plow in the uh, in the station there at North Station. No, go back. Waltham, Massachusetts, local on the Central Mass. Eleven twenty-eight in a flat top buggy. Pretty classic around that time period. Yeah, there's that end of, well, last year's of service. This is South Sudbury on the Central Mass. There's the 6148. And I think this is before it had its collision that we saw earlier. It's the late 60s, I think. Oh, yeah? <laughs> nice. Uh, the RS3s lasted into the early to mid-70s, um, but they were kind of, a, kind of a hot topic for photographers, especially running on local freights. This is an Air uh, 1511, one of the very last RS3s in service. And uh, this is, I scanned these last night. I started into the main central. I haven't really gotten that far on it yet. Um, but this is 1982. Um, road freight on the Con River line um, with B&M power and then main central GP7 uh, rebuilt from the Louisville and Nashville GP7, uh, Lonos 590. Nice series of color slides that he took. This is White River. Absolutely gorgeous shot, um, just south of Brattleboro along the Con River. You can see the bit of the train curving back towards Brattleboro in the background. Nice location. And I think this is the very last slide that I have. This is East Northfield, uh, 1982, southbound job, B&M and Main Central Power right before the Guilford takeover. Um, Looks like they got a lot of CP cars. This is probably CPSP, maybe. Um, Canadian Pacific to Springfield, Mass. Uh, connection job. And that's it. Beautiful.